Good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is uh, Bernie Rossoff, and I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the second day of the public meeting for the assessment of NIH research on autoimmune diseases. This is a congressionally mandated uh, study and uh, that is sponsored by the National Institute of Health. I'm joined by the committee members who are all participating virtually. I will ask them very briefly to introduce themselves because bios are available online in a few moments. Before we proceed, I would like to uh, once again note that this is an open on the record session. This is an information gathering session for the committee, which means that the committee is in the process of assembling materials that it will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings, its conclusions, and its recommendations. To date, the committee has made no conclusions. Comments made by individuals, including invited speakers and members of the committee should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. In addition, committee members typically ask questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. Please take, uh, keep that in mind. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing its draft report. Moreover, once the draft report is written, as most know, it goes through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee. And the committee must then respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's uh, report review committee and the National Academy's president before it is considered an official Academy's report. Yesterday, we heard from speakers representing a subset of the institutes that fund autoimmune research at NIH, who provided us with real good insights into the funding priorities and strategic process for their various institutes. Today, it's a little different. We will hear from experts speaking about scientific advances for autoimmune diseases, lupus, dermatologic autoimmune diseases, autoimmune thyroid diseases, and primary biliary cholangitis. First, we have Dr. Judith James speaking about advantage, advances and opportunities in lupus, followed by Dr. Victoria Wirth speaking about dermatologic autoimmune diseases. And next, Dr. Yaron Tomer will speak about autoimmune thyroid diseases. And finally, uh, Dr. Mark Peterson will speak about primary biliary cholangitis. Please note that this public session and invited speakers represent a continuing dialogue with experts for us from the NIH and from relevant disease experts. The committee will continue to invite other speakers as needed uh, for our upcoming meetings to inform us further related to our statement of task. Regarding the format for today's talk, uh, after each speaker's remarks, the committee will be able to ask very brief clarifying questions. All attendees can indicate their questions or comments at any time during this meeting by typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The Academy study team or myself will be tracking comments for speakers and the committee, and we'll, we'll try to respond as promptly as possible. Those who may want to speak subsequently with members of the committee are kindly asked to touch base with the staff officer, Henrietta Awo Osayento, by emailing autoimmune study at nas.edu. That's autoimmune study at nas.edu. And once again, the committee of the meeting is being recorded. Now, I'd like to ask the committee members to briefly introduce themselves. Well, Remembering bios are online. I'm Bernie Rossoff, I'm a gastroenterologist, professor of medicine at Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell and board of directors at Northwell Health System. Glinda? Hi, I'm Glinda Cooper. I'm an epidemiologist and my uh, research has been in systemic autoimmune diseases, including lupus and uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Deidre? Hi, I'm Deidre Cruz. I'm a nephrologist and professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins um, and also associate director for research development at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity. Bill? You know, I'm Bill Duncan. I'm an immunologist and vice provost of research at East Tennessee State University. I spent many years at NIH uh, overseeing and managing extramural research in the area of infectious disease, autoimmune disease, and organ transplantation. Delisa? Yes, Delisa Fairweather. I'm at uh, Mayo Clinic in Florida, and I'm director of translational research for the cardiovascular medicine department. And I have, uh, throughout my career, studied myocarditis and have an interest in sex differences 
in inflammation and autoimmune disease. Sonia? Hi, I'm Sonia Friedman, and I'm an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I work at Brigham and Women's Hospital as a gastroenterologist, and I specialize in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis um, and reproductive issues. Lisa? My name is Lisa Iasoni. I'm professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School based at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and my research focuses on healthcare disparities for people with disability. Andrea? I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine and a pediatric rheumatologist. I have a clinical research focus on lupus, on neuropsychiatric lupus, and mental health. Scott? Hello, I'm Scott Lieberman. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist and associate yeah. professor of pediatrics at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. And my research lab focuses on understanding the early immunological events in the development of Sjogren's disease. Michael? Yes, I'm Michael Lockshin. I'm professor of medicine and OBGYN at Hospital for Special Surgery uh, and Royal Cornell Medicine. I spent seven years as extramural director, then acting director of NIMS, and my interests have been largely in lupus, antiphospholipid, and pregnancies and autoimmune diseases. Jill? Hi, I'm Jill Norris. I'm professor and chair of epidemiology at the Colorado Public Health. My research interests um, have been in the nutrition and genetic epidemiology of type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. Barbara? Barbara Vickery, I'm chair of neurology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. I'm a health services researcher as well as a neurologist, and um, my research um, has been on um, uh, intervention, developing interventions to improve quality of care for neurologic conditions. Emily? Hi, Emily Summers. I'm an epidemiologist and associate professor at the University of Michigan. My primary appointments in rheumatology um, <coughs> where I specialize in lupus and other systemic autoimmune disorders. And I have a special interest in environmental health and women's health as, as applied to these disorders. Oh, well, perhaps the... Uh... The healthcare team should be uh, next. Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is <coughs> Wose Anto, and I'm the study director for uh, this particular study. And um, the NASAM team also comprises of uh, Kristen White, who is an associate program officer, uh, Dara Rosenberg, who is a research associate, and uh, Leila Maymand, who is a senior program assistant on the study. Thank you all very much. As you can see, we have experts from around the country uh, who will be addressing this issue. And uh, once again, the uh, National Academy team has been extremely uh, uh, complimentary to all of our work. And by the way, as I mentioned each day uh, that we have these meetings, uh, without them, this is not at all possible. So thanks again for everybody on the NASM team. Our first speaker <clears throat> is Dr. Judith James. Uh, she will be speaking about advances and opportunities in lupus. Dr. James is Vice President of Clinical Affairs at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, where she is also Chair of Arthritis and Clinical Immunology. Her group's lupus research led NIH to establish the Lupus Family Registry and Repository at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation at the Oklahoma University Health Science Center. She is Associate Vice Provost for Clinical and Translational Science, and she holds the Lu C. Kerr Endowed Chair in Biomedical Research. She is also the George Lynn Cross Professor of Research and a Professor of both Medicine and Pathology. Dr. James. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for this very kind invitation. I'm excited for us to be talking a little bit today about systemic lupus erythematosus. As many of you know as clinicians that lupus is a very clinically and biologically diverse autoimmune disease with complex etiology and pathogenesis. It can affect almost every organ system in the body and the one unifying feature is the presence of autoantibodies. And so when I was asked to give this very brief remarks, I was asked to talk about briefly epidemiology, recent advances, opportunities, and then the role of the NIH. And so just 
Uh, we have several people on the committee who've actually worked on the epidemiologic studies in lupus. Lupus is found around the world and we've had incidence and prevalence studies that have happened in multiple different countries. As you can see with the dark red, that we have high rates of lupus in our Alaskan native populations, as well as in American Indians that were part of the study and in other countries. And so if you look a little bit about the incidence and prevalence, you can see that this is high in Brazil and Puerto Rico, but also in multiple different studies that have happened in different parts of the country, including in Alaska, Georgia, Michigan, as well as in managed care organizations. Um, one of the things I really wanted to point out is that lupus is uh, disproportionately afflicts women. And so women are affected nine times as frequently as men, uh, but the mortality rates and the severity of the disease is still very disparate. And so we have mortality rates in our African-American lupus patients that remain significantly higher than we see in our European-American patients. And so if you look at five years after diagnosis, the cumulative mortality in African-American women uh, could still be as high as 20%. And at 10 years post-diagnosis, this could be getting close to 30%. And this makes this study not um, surprising is that if you go back and look at the leading causes of medical deaths in the United States, women of reproductive age um, tend to have as a top 10 cause of death um, complications associated with lupus. And so here we have all females and these are 15 to 24 years of age, a little bit older, and then 35 to 45. These are all women. You can see that lupus is a top 10 cause and the 11th in both 25 to 35 and 35 to 45 year olds. And then we have, if you look at African-American women, um, that this is the fifth highest medical cause of death as it is in um, Latina women. And so you can see that these remain high. And so we still have significant disparities, especially in the severity of the disease and the accelerated um, death that we see still in patients. And so um, when I was asked to give recent updates in lupus research, I asked if I could have several hours. They told me I have 20 minutes. And so I'm just hitting a few highlights. And of course, there are many, many others that I could not um, touch on today. One I wanted to focus on were defining preclinical events in lupus and lupus transitions from being autoantibody positive to developing clinical symptoms to developing um, classification criteria for systemic lupus erythematosus. There have been extensive studies that have focused on the genetic risk of lupus, having found now over 100 different genetic loci that have been associated and confirmed with lupus, and that this increasing um, genetic load can start being put together, especially for um, people of European descent, because that's where most of the original genetic association studies happened. We're seeing, starting to see some trickle out in other racial demographics. And so you can see that the sum of the variance starts to increase your odds of developing lupus. But if we use a weighted sum of those variants, that we can start to see significant elevation of the risk of lupus um, once you get past a weighted score of 82 to 80. And so there's significant work that's still going on in this area, but in addition to genetic risk, we know that there are other things that happen with immune dysfunction before patients transition to disease. And so our group has worked on with, in collaboration with the U.S. military, on trying to understand what are some of these early events that happen in lupus autoimmunity. We've described the presence of autoantibodies years before patients develop disease, and then in newer work have looked at the other kinds of immune um, uh, dysfunction that can occur uh, closer to the time of diagnosis, since you can see lupus patients compared to matched healthy controls, uh, three and a half years to within a month of diagnosis, we start seeing increasing levels of inflammatory and innate associated molecules. And we see the same thing with uh, Th1 type cytokines, maybe even earlier elevation in Th2 type cytokines. And then we see um, some changes in regulatory molecules, but this is even more pronounced when we looked at family members from this lupus family registry and repository that was mentioned. Um, and we went back and recontacted healthy family members that that had been enrolled on average six and a half years previously and found that we identified 56 additional family members who had transitioned to lupus compared to family members who were autoantibody positive but did not develop any new symptoms 
compared to ANA negative family members. And you can see even at baseline, so six years before patients um, transition to lupus, they already had elevated levels of a number of soluble mediators like shed receptors, um, bliss, TNF receptor, um, other interferon associated molecules like M MCP3 and stem cell factor, but very noticeable were they had very, very low levels of regulatory molecules like IL-10 and TGF beta. And so there's also been kind of an explosion of research that's happening with single cell technologies in lupus. Um, there was a paper that I'll talk about just briefly about single cell mapping in pediatric lupus, as well as in adult lupus compared to controls. The Accelerating Medicines Partnership in RA and lupus have published several papers looking at single cell RNA sequencing from lupus kidneys, as well as from lupus skin, along now with looking at phase two, which will have a much expanded data sets in lupus nephritis kidney biopsies with parallel urine samples and blood samples. We also have single cell technology evaluation of the impact of standard lupus medications on immune subsets, as well as identification of unique endotypes present in autoantibody positive individuals. And then of course, we can't um, not talk about the fact that we've started seeing a lot of research um, in similarities clinically and cytokine wise and immune dysfunction between the COVID-19 infection in certain individuals and lupus. And so this is the paper that I mentioned from Nature Immunology that just came out from uh, the Pasquale and Boschero group. And they profiled over 276,000 cells from 33 children with lupus and controls, as well as went back and looked at adult lupus patients. We knew that lupus patients had this interferon signature, but this paper showed us which cells this was coming from. Uh, we all expected the culprit to be plasma cytoid dendritic cells, and those were um, one of the culprits, but also we saw this interferon signature across multiple different cell types and even within subsets of those cell types. We also have started to try and integrate these different types of omic platforms together to give us more information about individuals who will develop autoantibodies but not transition versus those individuals who go ahead and become a lupus patient. And this has, has taken in parallel um, fluidime uh, cytoph data, which is basically looking at mass cytometry at the cell level with um, phosphocytoph, with cytokines, uh, autoantibody production, and antiviral responses. And this is starting to help us tease out differences that we see in African-American individuals with autoantibodies compared to European Americans with autoantibodies. There's also been a significant amount of work that's happening in dissecting the heterogeneity of lupus. We've thought about this from a clinical perspective for many years, thinking about lupus nephritis patients versus cutaneous lupus patients, um, but we haven't really thought about this at the molecular level until the last several years, and multiple groups have now published in this area, and we're seeing a lot of evolving work. And this has happened in pediatric lupus and an adult lupus investigation. Multiple groups have found different molecular clusters of pediatric and adult lupus patients, and that the select clusters can respond to treatment differently. So here we have 300 patients, and yellow is up and blue and purple is down. And you can see that cluster four, for example, has very high inflammation and interferon and lower um, expression level coming from B cells and T cells, while as other clusters like three and five have elevated levels coming from B and T cells, less so from inflammation and um, the interferon pathways. And these patients clinically look very, very similar, even though they have active disease. There's also looking at different lupus states. So patients who are quiescent versus patients who have an increased risk of having a flare very quickly. And so you can see that using machine learning and um, AI, we're able to differentiate patients who are going to respond very well to steroids and basically not have a flare in the upcoming days and weeks, and that the timing of flare is different in the people who late to flare versus early to flare, and that these are driven by different cell subsets, activated B cells in some, activated monocytes in others, and then in others we have activated B cells and activated monocytes that are elevated immediately before their flare. 
Of course, we've also been fortunate to have a number of different um, studies that have been published in Science, Cell, and Nature, Nature Medicine over the past few years. And these are just a few of these that you can see um, are kind of in multiple different areas. So if everything from complement and complement genes contributing to sex bias in lupus, but also in some other autoimmune diseases, um, looking at cell-free RNA and DNA and how may, this may help drive some of the innate immune um, dysregulation that we see to be central in lupus pathogenesis now. Of course, work in um, looking at um, different types of microbiome, and this was gut microbiome driving autoimmunity, not only in mouse models, but also in humans. And then looking at broad immune activation after vaccine response, which in some ways looks very similar to lupus, but in an uncontrolled fashion. And finally, of course, the innate immune system remains very important in uh, lupus pathogenesis. And there are new um, evolving information coming from this, including uh, immunometabolism and how immunometabolism may be important with um, adaptive immunity in driving lupus pathogenesis. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that for many, many years, we had no new FDA approved drugs for lupus. We had our first new FDA drug in 2011, which was after almost 50 years of waiting for new medications for lupus. However, in the past few months, we've seen approval for bulimumab and voclosporin uh, for lupus nephritis and other therapeutics are hopefully very close like anaphrolimab. Um, you can see we had several patients if several papers from the lupus field in the New England Journal uh, this last year. And this summary just kind of shows many, many different targets um, for lupus therapies, some of which are still under investigation, some of which unfortunately have failed in clinical trials. Um, but I think it's becoming more and more important. And we think of this more that partnering patient enrichment strategies so that we can find more homogeneous groups of lupus patients, perhaps even lupus patients, Sjogren's patients, sub sets of RA or inflammatory myositis patients that share um, pathogenic pathways that might respond to a therapy instead of just treating all lupus patients with the same drug. So if you ask 50 different lupologists to put together their pyramid of important topics, you would probably get 50 different uh, pyramids. This is mine. Uh, I didn't have time today to really talk about too many different environmental triggers, but that's an important area or on improving outcome in equality. Uh, but there are many different areas of lupus um, investigation that are ongoing and a significant number of additional opportunities. And so I think that whenever I was asked to think about opportunities, I could have definitely made this my entire 20 minutes. I basically tried to talk to some of my colleagues and come up with some of our top, but of course, these are just a few. And so, but I think uh, building on the work that's happening in preclinical studies, um, thinking about natural history studies, not just in lupus, but across different autoimmune diseases to see what are shared mechanisms of autoimmunity as these diseases develop. And what are unique mechanisms is a significant opportunity as well as prevention trials. And so I didn't mention it. I had the little logo for the SMILE trial, um, but there is a lupus prevention trial, which is currently ongoing, that's being led by Nancy Olson and David Karp. And it is focused on trying to prevent patients who have um, disease manifestations, but have not developed full-blown um, lupus classification. Um, but now that we're learning more about these preclinical events, it may be that uh, directed prevention trials directed at a target um, in patients who have significant risk is what we should be thinking about, as well as thinking about can we prevent pan autoimmunity, people who are at high risk of across the different autoimmune diseases um, from transitioning to autoimmune disease patients. Um, dissecting molecular heterogeneity. So we've talked about this and we're seeing a lot of advances here, but I think as things are, are evolving, how do we basically take this to the next level? How does this become an actionable marker that we can use in the clinics or that we can use in clinical trials to help identify those um, patients that 
need to be studied together or that need to be treated in similar ways and the people who could benefit from those same treatments. We also have perturb omics, which is what I think of. Um, we're doing a lot of single cell work, but mainly it's just in the cells as we pull them out of the patient, as opposed to thinking about what happens to those cells when they're stimulated or when um, some kind of event like an infection or an environmental trigger happens to that individual or perturbomics from the person level, studying vaccines or infections in people who already have dysregulated immune systems, like in those with autoimmune diseases. And of course, there are additional opportunities in understanding pathogenic mechanisms, hypothesis testing, discovery science, and then functional genomics to understand the risk, um, the risk and the pathogenic mechanisms that underlie many of these now associated and confirmed genetic associations. Um, we've been talking about this for a number of years, but I still think having a GWAS for environmental exposures and kind of your cumulative environmental exposures over time um, and um, expanded methodologies of how we start to put the different pieces together, including gene, gene, gene environment, cumulative interactions. And then, of course, we need different ways to be able to do trials that allow small, nimble, fast to fail clinical trials for autoimmune disease targets, and then to take some of the therapies that we know work really well, like corticosteroids work beautifully in lupus, but the toxicities are just too high for a chronic disease. How could we direct that therapy to the cells of interest? And then of course, autoimmune disease patients in some ways provide a unique opportunity to study comorbidities um, that affect a much broader aspect of the population because they have accelerated osteoporosis, accelerated atherosclerosis, accelerated brain aging, et cetera. And then I touched on this briefly, but we have a significant unmet need in understanding the molecular mechanisms of the different presentations, severity, and outcomes, especially in our African-American, American Indian, and uh, Hispanic patients. And how can we use the data that we do have to um, apply dissemination implementation science to improve outcomes in autoimmune disease patients. We're also generating bigger and bigger data sets. Many of those are NIH funded data sets and this sh um, should give us new opportunities to reanalyze mine um, meta-analysis of this type of molecular data to help move the field forward. And then finally, COVID um, and autoimmunity. We know that uh, some a small aspect of individuals who develop COVID um, can develop new onset autoantibodies. What are the mechanisms of these um, COVID associated autoimmunity? Um, what does it go away? What is the impact on autoimmune diseases for COVID infection and now vaccination? And on um, our patients taking immunomodulatory meds. So finally, I was asked to talk about the role of the NIH and I have to say, I'd never really thought about this. And so I took one step back and thought about the other institutions, uh, the other funding agencies that do support lupus research. And so the CDC has focused on some epidemiology, our American Pathology Rheumatology Research Foundation has training uh, vehicles, uh, DOD provides some very modest support for translational research. ARC and HHS do some DNI and equity, but very little of this is really focused on autoimmunity historically. FNIH with the NIH has um, taken on the Accelerating Medicines Partnership and some biomarker consortium. But if this is our house of autoimmunity, to me, the NIH remains what has to be our base. And that is the significant funder of discovery, basic, clinical and translational science. And that means that we need the NIH to continue to provide foundational support for these different types of science, but also to develop, lead, and implement cohesive programs across NIH centers and institutes, as well as the intramural and extramural communities um, with other funders to address our critical health problems for our patients with autoimmunity, to continue to forge novel private-public partnerships to support the broad spectrum of science and um, clinical research that we need for autoimmune disease, as well as to work with patient groups and patient advocacy councils um, to ensure that the clinical areas that are of a top importance to our patients, like fatigue, like brain fog, um, actually are focus of research. And then to serve as the central leadership for the science, our scientifically driven clinical care, um, improving diagnosis, prognosis, therapeutics, and ultimately prevention for autoimmune disease patients, especially lupus.
And so I will close there. And I have many people to thank, as well as the funding agencies from the NIH, including uh, the NAID Autoimmunity Centers of Excellence, um, NIAMS, and IGMS. Thank you. And thank you so much, Dr. James. Sorry that we couldn't offer you more time. Your topic is so rich with information. As you said, we could have used the whole two hours to, uh, to accomplish that, but uh, you certainly gave us uh, a good overview. Uh, if uh, the committee members have any clarifying questions, uh, please use the raise hands the feature in the participants tab, uh, and uh, we will acknowledge you uh, as we have with each of the uh, prior uh, speakers uh, yesterday. So uh, uh, I see Emily, we can start with you. Hi, Emily Summers, the University of Michigan. That was a fabulous talk. I agree, we wish we could have more time to hear more of what you have to say. Um, I'm really interested by the, towards the end, you had the slide of the House of Research. Um, you mentioned the other agencies in the federal government, including the CDC and DOD, and et cetera. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on coordination across agencies in order to make sure that there are not gaps remaining in the overall portfolio. One example I can think of from the lupus world is the lupus federal working group. And that seems to be one way to get stakeholders together, although it's not entirely clear um, what comes out of that exactly in terms of setting the agenda. So I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on how to make sure there are gaps that are not left unaddressed, um, including things like these um, larger long-term investments in infrastructure to build cohorts that could be used in multiple ways. So Emily, I think that's a really good question. And so I was gonna bring up the federal working group, but I think that um, you know that's one aspect. I think that the NIH has tried um, across the different institutes to make sure that they're covering different areas. But especially when you think about late stage translational research, um, dissemination, implementation, how do we interface better with ARC and with PCORI and with some of those um, other funding agencies, I think that we haven't probably made the perfect connection, Jen. I think we have opportunities there as well as with the private foundations um, because you know Lupus is fortunate to have two large foundations that work um, for our patients and work with patient outcomes, um, but also provide funding and how do we make sure that those integrate with what the NIH sees. And so, as you know, NIAMS, NAID, um, multiple different institutes have put together their strategic plans and they talk about autoimmunity, um, but I don't think there's a cohesive autoimmunity strategic plan for how we make sure that we're not missing gaps, as you say. Oh, I don't see any raised hands on my list. Do you have anything that I'm missing? No, I, I don't see any uh, raised hands either. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, Dr. James, I'm sure there'll be questions as the day goes on and uh, pre certainly appreciate your presentation. Uh, the next speaker will discuss advances and opportunities in dermatologic autoimmune diseases, uh, Dr. Victoria Wirth. Dr. Wirth is professor of dermatology and medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and the VA Medical Center. She is chief of dermatology at the uh, Philadelphia VA Hospital and her clinical and research expertise is in autoimmune skin disease, uh, Dr. Wirth. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And I'm gonna uh, uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the role of uh, skin disease and autoimmunity. And here I think the emphasis has to be on quality of life. Uh, these patients often do not die, but if you can make their skin disease better, they have a great quality of life. But this slide highlights the fact that there's a huge impact on the emotional realm of quality of life measured with skin-directed quality of life scores. And here you can see in blue is lupus, dermatomyositis, uh, psoriasis is up here. And these are really elevated and poor quality of life scores that are related to the skin disease. If one goes a step further and looks at elements of uh, other serious systemic diseases using the SF36, you can look at congestive heart failure, type 2 diabetes, recent MI, and so on. And all these areas in yellow are areas where these patients with serious systemic disease have better quality of life than patients with cutaneous lupus, which have a lower score in areas such as social functioning, role, emotional, and mental health. So quality of life is uh, severely impacted, and I want to show some examples of that with discoid lupus, with dermatomyositis, 
uh, with Pemphigus vulgaris, Bullis pemphigoid, and mucosal pemphigoid, uh, alopecia areata, vitiligo, and hydratinitis. And this is a large group of diseases, and uh, that's, you know, I, I will apologize if I can't talk about all of these in 20 minutes. But I do want to highlight that in terms of the epidemiology, we know that diseases like psoriasis, eczema, vitiligo, and alopecia areata are really quite common and almost in the realm of rheumatoid arthritis. <clears throat> and um, there's uh, increasing ability to understand these diseases, their heterogeneity and treatment, but there's much to work to be done. Hydratinitis superativa has had very few studies. It's just beginning, and yet it affects quite a number of predominantly women and African-Americans. And autoimmune blistering diseases include pemphigus, which is a little less common, but bolus pemphigoid, again, is uh, not uncommon and is increasing with our aging population and with increased uh, exposure to new medications. And then I would be remiss in not mentioning cutaneous lupus, dermatomyositis, morphia, and leukocytoclastic vasculitis, all of which are skin uh, predominant areas of, of what can be systemic disease. And it's important to emphasize that uh, this area of skin disease has been relatively understudied and has a huge impact, as I pointed out, on quality of life. Now, I was actually, by the meeting organizers given this slide, but suggesting that there is certainly funding for many autoimmune diseases, but certainly um, it's hard to find anything other than psoriasis on this list, and it would be interesting to look at that more carefully, but I think this speaks to the idea that there's really a lot of work to be done in the area of uh, autoimmune skin disease. There, as I said, huge effects on quality of life, which remain underappreciated, and quality of life likely needs to be a factor uh, in terms of determining importance of funding since it can improve the disease activity and quality of life can improve when that happens. There is the beginning and some uh, important investigator-initiated clinical research in autoimmune skin disease. Uh, again, very early, and NIH is helping to fund some of this. And there's proportionally less research in certain autoimmune skin diseases, especially in areas where there are skin manifestations in addition to systemic features. There have been, um, this, this area is really well, relatively underdeveloped, and I will show you some examples of that, but there are gaps in disease definitions that would allow even including patients who have skin manifestations of disease within the context of the, of the systemic disease. There's also um, pathogenesis of the disease heterogeneity is often unclear, and why are different organs affected? There's a need for clinical research that examines the biologic basis for heterogeneity of disease and responses to therapy. In other words, looking also not just from bench to bedside, but also bedside back to bench. And it's vital to define research uh, that allows study of these skin predominant patients in a way that will lead to the approval of, of not just new therapies, but understanding of the disease that will lead to new therapies. And without that definition, um, these patients really get left out. So there have been a number of successful NIH funding mechanisms. There have been early trials funded by NIAMS and NIAID uh, predominantly, and they have funded, for instance, uh, some very early pemphigus trials, uh, recently funded uh, an amyopathic dermatomyositis trial, the first one ever, and I think that NIH has served a role in start, jump-starting some of these initiatives for more rare diseases that need to be studied. And um, there have been scientific studies linked to clinical trials with R01 and R21 mechanisms, which I think are a really powerful way of doing more of this bedside-to-bench kind of work. There have been R01s that have looked at cell therapy as proof of principle with T regulatory cells for pemphigus being looked at, CAR T cells for pemphigus, and also anti-IL-15 for vitiligo. And then I'll talk a little bit more about those studies, but um, these have been a very important proof of principle types of, of studies. There have been um, a number of mechanisms that have helped systemic autoimmune disease, and I think um, one of them, for instance, and a very good example is the NIH-funded Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium, which I think no one would argue has really um, made huge advances in understanding at many levels of vasculitis. I think the AMP, the Accelerating Medicine Partnership, we heard about in the lupus talk, and it's focused very much on RA and lupus nephritis. Um, it would be very interesting to think of mechanisms that could allow focus more on the skin aspects of autoimmune skin disease. Um, and so there have been early career K awards for training, which I think are vital for getting people into this field. Um, and we need also more translational research training um, to, that will help in some of these orphan diseases to develop um, the treatments that are needed. Um, the CTSAs, I want to say, have been extremely valuable for the infrastructure and also for providing funding for masters in translational research and other types of clinical uh, research degrees. 
And then the K-24 Mid-Career Awards, we have a very leaky pipeline in this part of the field, and it's critical to sustain clinical and translational investigation uh, into mid-career because those people really have a lot to offer. Now, some of the successes, um, there have been some early studies with rituximab, which works, for instance, for Pemphigus vulgaris, and it's been approved now by FDA. We have a huge therapeutic armamentarium for psoriasis, but not much understanding about exactly how which drug goes for which patient. Uh, adalimumab is the only drug and recently approved for hydradenitis superativa, but how do we identify subsets of patients who will a priori benefit from a given therapy? And that really extends across the whole range of autoimmune skin disease. I want to give you an example of the kind of study that could be helpful, for instance, was done in hydradenitis supertiva, looking at response to anti-TNF therapy. And you can see very big differences in the B cells and B cell signatures uh, uh, that are um, seen in responders to TNFs, and this is uh, in skin prior to treatment, relative to non-responders. And there's a lot of this kind of work that needs to go on to be able to really, truly advance our understanding. And much of this can feed back into understanding the heterogeneity of the disease itself. There are new potential therapeutic approaches that are being investigated for Pemphigus and funded largely by NIAMS, NIAID. And um, these, again, I mentioned, but what Treg cells have been looked at in terms of lupus and Pemphigus, uh, CAR T cells. And these are good for scientific proof of principle. There's an ongoing study. These are growing out of NIH-funded mechanisms looking at anti-IL-15 for vitiligo. There's a real need for A treatment for vitiligo that actually works. Lena Basin was funded uh, to look at uh, amyopathic dermatomyositis. So I wanted to give you some highlights. This is looking at CAR T cells, and these desmoglion-3, desmoglion antibodies trigger um, the, the loss of skin uh, uh, adhesion, cohesion in uh, Pemphigus vulgaris, and it's possible to target the desmoglion-3 specific B cells with these CAR T cells. And in this mouse model, what you can see is that those who got uh, the CAR T cells actually did not get blisters, don't have antibodies deposited here, but you can see blister formation in the control CAR and lots of antibodies in the skin. And so this is, again, a nice proof of principle to make sure that we understand the basic uh, pathophysiology of the disease and potentially may lead to new treatments. With vitiligo, CD8-positive T cells um, target melanocytes. And there are resident memory T cells in the skin that have been examined in mouse models and humans. And now, based again on R01 funding, uh, a, a study that will is going to look at anti-IL-15 for vitiligo. And what this is showing is in the mouse model for vitiligo that you can see with the antibody against IL-15 that you get induction of pigmentation in this mouse tail relative uh, to the beginning of the study, and you don't see anything with the control and the control antibody. So increased pigmentation, again, a very potentially interesting approach to treating uh, another important autoimmune skin disease. Now, moving on to lupus, we know that there's something called interface dermatitis. It's an interferon signature in the skin with upregulated proteins such as mix A and chemokines. And these have been seen in the blood. They correlate in the blood with the interferon score correlates with the activity in the skin. And so interferons have become very interesting as a potential modality. Um, there's been interest in looking again at some of the heterogeneity, and what this is showing you is that there are lots of plasmacyte toy dendritic cells in panel B seen in both uh, uh, responders to one therapy versus two therapies together that pa patients here did not respond to just uh, the hydroxychloroquine. But what's different is that we see many more myeloid dendritic cells in the plaquenil quinidine responders relative to plaquenil, and that, and that you can see here. So this also can be looked at in the skin, and this is just an example of the kinds of work that's very early days and needs to be done on a much broader scale for many of these autoimmune skin diseases. But this is looking at the type 1 interference signature in a number of different genes and showing an increase in hydroxychloroquine treated relative to the people who needed a second animal aerial. And it's true for multiple genes of the type 1 interferon upregulated genes, whereas with TNF, it's just the reverse. There's a TNF signature here and not seen in the plaquenil, responder, in the plaquenil responders. So understanding is leading to what cell types are there, what potential signatures are important, will eventually, I think, lead to understanding how to approach looking at therapies. So based on what we know about type 1 interferons, and we heard about anaphrolimab for SLE, well, it also works in skin, and there are ways of targeting PDCs, and again, will be very interesting in looking at these studies to do reverse translational studies, um, again, back to the bench, uh, to understand the importance of PDCs in pathogenesis of CLE. 
This is just looking at an example of a, a study where um, when, you, when you actually block uh, with a, an antibody against type 1 interferon receptor, um, placebo here, the patients who got the two drugs uh, actually did much better, um, and they had many more responders relative to placebo, and this is the kind of response you would get. So this is a proof of principle that type 1 interference are important, but there's much to understand about which, what cells are making the interference and uh, which interference are important. Here you can see that the interference signature goes down and correlates with that improvement I showed you in the previous slide. And going on to a phase 3 trial, you can actually appreciate that, again, twice as many patients early on are better with, with an intervention that gets rid of the type 1 interferon relative to placebo. So this is very exciting because, really, there's been no new therapies in over 60 years um, for the skin part of cutaneous lupus, and this seems to work in skin. Now, I want to move on and talk a little bit about PDCs, which I told you make type 1 interferons, and they're important because they're activated by RNA and DNA and induce interferon-inducible chemokines that recruit T cells to the skin, and we can label these with BDCA2. Well, there was interest in developing an antibody against BDCA2 called BIB59, and what this is showing, again, is a translational study where you can see that the MIX1, which is the type 1 upregulated protein, and one, after what single therapy at one month um, goes away in the responders and correlates with the response to therapy. Whereas in non-responders, there's nothing that happens to the MIX-A. It's still there, and the patient doesn't get better. So, and this correlated with also the removal of uh, inflammatory cells in the people who responded. And here you can see the improvement in skin and three doses relative to placebo. So the big question is, who gets better and who doesn't? Who is going to benefit? What is the role of PDCs? Um, and this is really a critical question. Another approach, getting rid of anti-PDC with an ILT7 antibody, same situation where in some but not all patients, you can actually take a patient with lots of mix A in the skin, the brown staining goes away with, with the treatment with a, a drug that removes PDCs, and the skin score gets better in the high-treated uh, patients who re, re, uh, get rid of their PDCs. So this is the kinds of studies and approaches, again, that will be needed for many of our autoimmune skin diseases. I do want to highlight an R21-funded trial, again, the first one for non-psychoactive cannabinoid, uh, looking at dermatomyositis skin. And with a very small, we've talked about short trials and how to get better at doing these. Well, the skin is a beautiful way of looking at proof of principle and can respond very quickly. This is just a, a four-month trial. And you can see that the people um, who got drug did better, statistically more better than the placebo group. And this was only a study with 22 patients. And this is the kind of improvement that was seen and the kind of quality of life improvement. These are the people who got better with quality of life relative to the placebo groups, and that was true across a number of different measures. And the nice thing about this, these types of funding mechanisms, you can actually look at some of the um, biomarkers and, and look at what's happening in the gamma interferon goes down in the treated patients versus in the placebo group. So this is a really um, interesting, and now they've gone on to a phase three trial, and again, potentially there's going to be some real opportunities with R01 funding to be able to understand more about um, what cells are in the skin and DM and which ones are responding, and, and, uh, and again, reverse translation. This is something that is of importance in terms of knowing how to advance the field. We uh, recently have found that CD123 PDCs that I showed you in lupus are really not very present in dermatomyositis, but we didn't know that, and we would only know that, uh, we need to know that to know that we don't want to use, use a PDC-targeted therapy if there are no PDCs in the skin. So the types of scientific approaches now that are available are, are really amazing. We heard about these in the last uh, talk. Um, use of cytop of the skin is a wonderful organ to look at, transcriptomics, digital spatial profiling, where you can actually look at gene expression and protein level expression epigenomic profiling. This can lead to the awareness of new cell subsets that are important drivers of disease heterogeneity in response to therapy. And we, there's a need for personalized medicine as things are evolving and to define diseases by molecular endotypes. Also, there's an important role for targeted animal models to advance new therapeutics. So this is an example of Cytoff applied to dermatomyositis. And what this shows, if, we're not, if there's not PDCs in the skin, well, what is there? And you can see that there are macrophages and myeloid DCs. Uh, a very different kind of scenario than what we see in many of our lupus patients. And you can see the orange and red here are the myeloids and uh, cells that you don't see in normal controls. And what's nice about this kind of technique is you can actually see what, um, what pathways are activated and what cells are activated and get a lot of information um, that will be helpful going forward. 
Another example is, uh, again, how basic this field is, is not understanding the, the endotypes that might explain or the cytokines that might differentiate dermatomyositis from lupus, which is really important if you're trying to understand basic pathogenesis or even do any kind of uh, therapeutic trials. And so here, IL-18 is much higher in DM than in CLE, and again, very important to know these things and to do these kinds of studies. So in terms of recommendations, I mean, this is a very young field. All of these fields are young in autoimmune skin disease. Um, we, I think we need to include impact on quality of life for determining funding in autoimmune skin disease. Uh, we need to continue to expand the focus of research funding to include skin aspects of systemic autoimmune disease, which until recently has been really understudied. Um, we need to apply technologic advances to study skin and blood in autoimmune skin diseases. And a consortium that would help um, link centers together to study some of the rare autoimmune skin diseases that would be wonderful, such as modeling, again, the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium and the AMP. And I think with that, the other thing is training in centers. There's overall a need for funding of fellowships and career development awards to develop and replenish the workforce. It's a very thin workforce in autoimmune skin disease. And also to emphasize that the CTSA is very helpful for the needed translational focus for autoimmune disease and also for training. And with that, I thank you very much. Well, we thank you, Dr. Wirth. Uh, this has been very, very uh, informative to us uh, regarding uh, dermatology, which was a request, by the way, uh, that we bring this to the committee early on and we've, we've honored that request. If the committee has any questions, please once again, raise hands and identify and we will be happy to uh, acknowledge. And if any of any, any public participant has questions as well, please remember to use the Q&A function and we will bring your questions up to the speakers to be answered. Uh, Deidre. Thank you. Um, so uh, wonderful uh, presentations. And I, I, um, I had a question for, um, I think it was Dr. Worth, who was the, uh, the last speaker, actually. Um, um, when you touched upon kind of the, the, uh, the availability of a number of different treatments, some of them kind of newly emerging um, for autoimmune skin diseases, you mentioned something around, um, but, but there's still a question around kind of which therapy is most appropriate for, um, for kind of which patient. And it made me wonder if there has been much in the way of um, collaboration with, with institutes like uh, PCORI, uh, who, who do fund comparative effectiveness research. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Right. Well, we've had very thin amounts of therapy to talk about for cutaneous disease. And, you know, there's essentially, I have to say, NIH did fund the prospective databases and actually the an ongoing R01 collaborative R01 um, to really look at outcomes. But the, in general, with the thin therapeutics, there's more of a ladder and not really two therapies that we need to be comparing. I would like to get to that point, And I'd be open to suggestions about how to do that. Yeah. Any other questions? I see any additional questions. Yes. Oh, well, did I interrupt you? I was just saying there are no additional questions. Yeah, I don't have any additional questions on my end either. So once again, Dr. Worth, thank you very, very much. I'm sure we'll uh, think of others as we go through the day. The, next, uh, the next topic is advances and opportunities in uh, autoimmune thyroid disease. And the speaker is Dr. Yaron uh, Tomer. Uh, Dr. Tomer holds the Anita and Jack Souls Chair in Diabetes Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Montefiore Medical Center. He is the Chair of the Department of Medicine and a Professor of Endocrinology. He is also a Professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. His research focuses on the immunogenetics of and the gene env uh, in environment interactions in autoimmune thyroid disease and type 1 diabetes in addition to the environmental chemical triggers of type one diabetes. Dr. Tomer. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rosso, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the committee for inviting me to uh, speak to you today about a topic I'm very passionate about. I've been studying uh, the mechanisms uh, of autoimmune thyroid diseases and treating patients with autoimmune thyroid diseases for over 25 uh, years. Uh, just briefly to introduce autoimmune thyroid diseases. These are complex diseases, like all autoimmune diseases, that are caused by a interaction between 
susceptibility genes and environmental factors, and prominent amongst them are infection and iodine in the diet. This interaction is an epigenetic interaction that has now been deciphered at the molecular level um, and leads to infiltration of the thyroid with autoreactive T cells. And it can lead to two outcomes. These T cells can activate cytotoxic T cells to cause thyroid cell apoptosis, destruction of the gland, and hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid, a disease called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Or the T helper cells can activate B cells to become plasma cells, secrete TSH receptor stimulating antibodies or TSI that will activate the TSH receptor on the surface of thyroid cells to activate the overproduction of thyroid hormones and overactive thyroid or hyperthyroidism, a disease called Graves' disease. And I'll, I'd like, uh, like all other speakers, I would have loved to have five hours, but I'll take the 15, 20 minutes that I've got. And I'll try to cover uh, briefly the epidemiology, the unmet need, uh, how NIH funded research is driving new exciting therapies and uh, my uh, perspective on the future of autoimmune thyroid disease uh, research, my recommendation. So starting with epidemiology, across all epidemiological studies that compared autoimmune diseases, autoimmune thyroid diseases are always shown to be the commonest autoimmune diseases with Hashimoto's as the most uh, prevalent autoimmune disease and number two is Graves' disease. And thanks to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey or ENHANCE, we have actually ac very accurate data on the prevalence of Hashimoto's and Graves. So in the ENHANCE, they found that the prevalence of hypothyroidism in the US is 4.6%, hyperthyroidism 1.3%, and subclinical autoimmune thyroid disease manifesting by thyroid antibodies 11%. This translates to more than 15 million people in the US with hypothyroidism and more than 4 million people in the US with hyperthyroidism. Now, through many studies, we know that amongst these two groups, about 80% of the hypothyroid patients will have Hashimoto's and 80% of the hyperthyroid will have Graves' disease, which translates again to more than 10 million people in the US with Hashimoto's and more than 3 million people in the US with Graves' disease. And this may be even an underestimate because some local studies have suggested the frequencies are even higher, like the Colorado thyroid disease prevalence study that showed double that prevalence as in the Haynes. Now, I'd like to uh, focus uh, about the unmet uh, need of autoimmune thyroid diseases. These are actually uh, very serious diseases that cause a lot of uh, morbi morbidity um, and um, decreasing quality of life. Uh, Graves' disease is associated with a serious uh, complication, um, serious eye disease called Graves' ophthalmopathy in 20 to 30% of patients. It causes proptosis or protrusion of the eyes, chemosis, and can lead to uh, visual deficits and um, blindness. Um, less commonly, but still seen in Graves' disease, is the skin manifestation called pretibial myxedema or Graves' dermopathy uh, that can uh, lead to this serious uh, skin disorder that can uh, advance to elephantiasis of the legs. Um, and unfortunately, the treatment of Graves' disease hasn't changed in the past 70 years. All that you see here was already available in the 1950s. And all we have for Graves' disease are three treatments. Thionamides or antithyroid drugs, which include propylthiouracil or PTU and methimazole, radioactive iodine or um, surgery, which are basically um, ways to remove the thyroid either by surgery or by ablation and then replace thyroid hormones by, thyroid, uh, by levothyroxine. All these are associated with complications and are very suboptimal. All these do not address the autoimmune process, but simply um, put the brakes on the overactive thyroid. And um, the thionamides are associated with serious complications. In fact, most societies do not recommend taking them uh, except as a bridge until you do one of these two things, radioactive iodine or thyroidectomy, which we call definitive therapy, uh, because they are associated with agranulocytosis, which is um, the disappearance, literally, of the white blood cells from the blood. This is idiosyncratic. It's not allergic, so it's not predictable. If you took uh, PTU or methimazole for a few weeks, nothing happened. It doesn't mean anything. I've seen patients three, four years on the medication, same dose, uh, develop it. Um, and because the warning signs are only fever and sore throat, we basically have to have our patients on these medications every time they have fever and sore throat, which obviously happens frequently, call us whether it's middle of the afternoon or middle of the night and do a CBC to check that they don't have egg granulocytosis. Also, there is liver toxicity, vasculitis, and birth defects. 
Um, like other autoimmune diseases, Graves and Hashimoto's are five to 10 times more common in women and mostly in women of reproductive age. So many patients with Graves and Hashimoto's become pregnant. And um, uh, we use actually PTU in pregnancy because it's a little bit safer, but both of these are associated with 10% of uh, cases in birth defects. Radioactive iodine used to be popular, but we've learned recently that it can severely worsen Graves' ophthalmopathy, the eye disease, or even uh, trigger it de novo. It also accumulates in the breast, the transporter that transports iodine into the thyroid cells, the uh, sodium iodine symporter is also expressed on the breast ductile tissues. And when you give radioactive iodine, it goes to the breast and uh, there is a risk um, that, um, and, and, and a concern about breast uh, cancer. Um, in addition, after radioactive iodine, the TSH receptor stimulating antibody levels increase significantly because of the inflammation it induces and they stay high for three to five years. Now, if after that, uh, the patient becomes pregnant, they will have very high levels of these antibodies in their blood that will cross the placenta and cause complications. So in most cases, if a patient with great, newly diagnosed Graves disease uh, says to us that uh, she's thinking of becoming pregnant in the next, next three to five years, we will not give radioactive iodine. And surgery is associated with all the complications of surgery, but specifically to the thyroid, because the recurrent laryngeal nerve that uh, innervates the vocal cords passes through the thyroid. Uh, in 2% of cases, sometimes 3%, there is vocal cord paralysis permanent, which means permanent hoarseness for life. And if the parathyroids are, are damaged, there'll be hypocalcemia for life, which again is challenging to manage. And in patients that are either with Hashimoto's or underwent removal of their thyroid and now are replaced, uh, replacement with levothyroxine is actually very challenging because uh, of its inconsistent absorption and completely different bioavailability between different brands. And unfortunately, our patients with changing insurances every time are forced to change brands. So this all results in a many studies showing that more than 50% of patients are actually not balanced. They're not with thyroid. They're either over-treated or under-treated, not because the physicians don't know what they're doing, but because of these challenges. And if you are hyperthyroid or hypothyroid for prolonged periods of time, even if it's subclinical or asymptomatic, it's associated with a lot of uh, risks. And I won't list all of them, but the two most important ones. And the first one is the increased mortality, which has been consistently shown even in subclinical asymptomatic hypo and hyperthyroidism. In this recent study, they showed that if you are hypothyroid, your in mortality is increased by 5% for every six months you are hypothyroid. Again, even if it's asymptomatic. And if you're hyperthyroid, the mortality is increased by 18% for every six months that you are hyperthyroid. Another very worrisome and consistently found in many studies risk is risk of dementia. And in this study that was just published, they actually calculated it to be a 12% risk of dementia for every six months that the patient is hypothyroid, even if subclinical. As I mentioned, many patients with Graves and Hashimoto's are women of reproductive age and they become pregnant. And in pregnancy, the, just the presence of autoimmune thyroid disease increases risks. But if the patient is not perfectly balanced, which is even more challenging during pregnancy because estrogens change the thyroid binding uh, globulin levels, uh, this can result in a lot of complications, both to the mother and the baby, such as pregnancy loss, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, and in children that were tested five to eight years after they were born of mothers that were either hypothyroid or hyperthyroid during pregnancy, there is low IQ and autism spectrum disorder. So as you can see, there is a great unmet need. There is a significant public health um, um, impact of autoimmune thyroid diseases, and we definitely don't have good treatments. And while I could talk about many um, studies um, that were done about mechanisms, for example, very exciting studies that the secret at the molecular level, how interferon alpha, which is also important in uh, autoimmune thyroid disease, like in lupus, interacts with specific genetic variants in uh, thyroid genes to trigger autoimmune thyroid disease. I wanted to focus my NIH, uh, my, my uh, part on advances, only on advances that led to actual treatments. And I'll focus on three medications, one that is already FDA approved, one which is now in clinical trials and one which is uh, finishing the preclinical phase and hopefully will go into IND and clinical trials. The first one is teprotumumab, which is FDA approved for Graves' ophthalmopathy uh, just a year ago, iscalimab, 
anti-CD40, which is in clinical trials for Graves' disease and other autoimmune diseases, and sephrantin, a molecule that we discovered in my lab that is finishing the clinical studies. So let's start with the protumumab. Um, the, the origin of Graves of Thalmopathy has been a mystery for many years. No one understood why only uh, the eyes. But through NIH-funded research over the last three decades, we've learned a lot about it. We've learned that the key cell is the orbital fibroblast, which is in the orbit behind the eyes. It proliferates and secretes glycosaminoglycans and inflammatory molecules, triggering inflammation, um, accumulation of glycosaminoglycans and pushing of the uh, eyes uh, forward. Um, and this is why all the immunosuppressive medications that were tried, including rituximab, high dose steroids, do not work because the inflammation alone is not the issue, it's this fibroblast. But what we didn't know is what's driving this fibroblast to do this. And through NIH funded research, uh, led by uh, the group of Terry Smith at uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, they discovered that both the TSH receptor, the target in Graves' disease, and the IGF-1 receptor are expressed on these orbital fibroblasts and are interacting and being activated by TSH receptor stimulating antibodies and IGF-1 receptor antibodies. And this led to a trial of an IGF-1 receptor blocker teprotumumab uh, that was originally developed for cancer but failed in cancer in graves of thalmopathy. And the results were dramatic, something like we've never seen before. 83% of patients on teprotumumab after 24 weeks went into complete remission and the average reduction in the proptosis was uh, more than three millimeters, which uh, is huge. And you can see here a patient on placebo, the eye disease actually worsened after 24 weeks, if you compare, and the patient on te uh, tepertumumab, very dramatic response like we've never seen except patients that undergo surgery, uh, which is an orbital decompression, which is a complicated uh, surgery. So through NIH-funded research, we've been able to get to this uh, stage where we can now offer our patients treatment after we've never been able to offer them uh, any treatment except surgery. I want to move to Iskalimab, which is a monoclonal antibody targeting CD40. You all know that CD40 is a uh, co-stimulatory molecule expressed on antigen-presenting cells, that it's key to the crosstalk between T cell and antigen-presenting cell. And on B cells, it drives the immunoglobulin isotype switch to IgG secretion. And to summarize uh, 20 years of research in one slide, in 2002, my group discovered that CD40 uh, was mapped through whole genome linkage studies and fine mapping uh, uh, as a susceptibility genes for gene for Graves' disease. We identified a specific SNP in the 5' UTR that predisposes to Graves' disease, and this has been later replicated by many groups. And later, CD40 was found to be associated with other autoimmune diseases, most prominently rheumatoid arthritis, but also multiple sclerosis, lupus, and psoriasis. In 2005, we discovered that the SNP in CD40 that's associated with Graves' disease is a functional SNP and the risk allele drives higher expression of CD40. And again, this was later confirmed in MS and lupus. And therefore, we uh, tested the hypothesis that uh, genetically driven by this SNP, overexpression of CD40 in the thyroid is uh, the cause uh, of um, the predisposition it uh, confers to Graves' disease and targeting of the thyroid. So we created transgenic mice that overexpress CD40 in the thyroid and inducing them Graves' disease, experimental autoimmune Graves' disease. And indeed, uh, the disease was more severe. And when we knocked out CD40 in the thyroid, it suppressed disease. Just to show uh, a little bit from these studies, this is Graves' disease in a mouse. This is a normal mouse. You see the trachea and the normal thyroid. And on histology, you see the single line cuboidal epithelium lining the colloid. In the Graves' disease mouse, you see the large thyroid. It's brown because it's full of colloid with our globulin and the TSH receptor stimulating antibodies stimulate proliferation of the cells. They have high levels of TSH receptor antibodies and high levels of T4, they are thyroid toxic. And when we compare the transgenic mice overexpressing CD40 to the wild type mice, you see that they had higher levels of TSH receptor antibodies and they were more thyroid toxic with higher levels of T T4. Um, therefore, um, a, when a monoclonal antibody an targeting anti uh, CD40 was developed, um, it was tested in Graves' disease in this study that was published just a year ago uh, by Kahali et al. This is a pilot study only in 15 patients, but very encouraging. Of the 15 patients, about half seven responded with uh, 
uh, reduction, complete normalization of the TSH receptor antibodies and the T4, and eight did not respond. They did show a slight decrease in antibodies, but they did not respond to needed rescue medication. We actually asked the question, how come only half responded and half did not? And we hypothesized that maybe this is determined by the um, susceptible uh, SNP that was discovered. And indeed in studies that are unpublished that we hope to uh, submit soon, we found that all the responders had the risk allele of the susceptible SNP and all the non-responders carried the protective allele. So this opens the door to a personalized approach to treating with iskalimab, not just Graves' disease, but if it will be effective in other autoimmune diseases by first uh, testing this SNP and deciding who will respond and who will not respond. And finally, I want to tell the story of Seferantin. Again, to summarize 20 years of research in one slide, um, in 2004, we discovered a specific pocket signature in HLA-DR3 that was associated with autoimmune thyroid disease. HLA-DR3 is known to be the HLA-DR that's associated with autoimmune thyroid disease for many years, but there is a specific um, sequence and signature in the peptide binding pocket that contains arginine at position 74 of the HLA-DR beta-1 chain that is specific for autoimmune thyroid disease. And a few years later, uh, other groups and us identified the specific T-cell epitope that triggers autoimmune thyroid disease. It's a thyroid globulin peptide called PG2098. And with this knowledge of knowing the uh, specific pocket that triggers autoimmune thyroid disease and the specific peptide, we set to block the presentation of this uh, peptide by this pocket. And through a screening of hundreds of thousands of molecules, we identified one sephirantin that can block the pocket and not let uh, antigen presenting cells present this peptide to T cells and trigger autoimmune thyroid disease. And later we showed that sephirantin can prevent experimental autoimmune thyroiditis, which is a mouse model of Hashimoto's in humanized mice that carry the human HLA-DR3 and later um, sephirantin was shown to prevent experimental Graves' disease in humanized mice. So the idea here is that you block the presentation of the pathogenic peptide by the antigen presenting cells to the T cells to block all the downstream effects that lead to autoimmune thyroid disease. And if successful, this is both a specific and personalized approach. And I think this is the future of treatment of many autoimmune diseases. It's specific because we're only blocking those T cells that respond to these autoantigens, but other HLA class two are not blocked and they can still uh, present peptides uh, to T cells to respond to infection. So there's no global immune suppression where most immunosuppressive th therapies cause, but specific immune suppression. And it's personalized because this will only work in patients that have HLA-DR3. This is specific for DR3, which is about 30 to 40% of autoimmune thyroid disease patients. So the other 60 to 70% will be spared the medication that we know a priori will not uh, work for them. So in my opinion, talking about the future, this is the future of uh, autoimmune thyroid disease and other autoimmune diseases to have a specific and personalized approach uh, to uh, suppressing the autoimmune response. This is sephirantin sitting in the pocket. The arginine in position 74 is facing it. And even though it's a small molecule and it's a large groove, it's sitting in the, in the key pocket, P1, which is a key for peptide binding. So what is sephirantin? It's actually a plant alkaloid that's extracted from the plant Stefania sephiranta hayata. It's been used in Japan in humans uh, for 40 years to treat many conditions. And while still not FDA approved for any indications, we're currently in discussions with a biotech firm. In fact, today I got an email from another biotech that's interested in it to go for IND enabling studies and try uh, sephirantin in humans. So in the last uh, two slides, I want to talk about the future of autoimmune thyroid disease uh, research from my perspective. I think that we are in a pivotal moment in autoimmune thyroid disease research. After 70 years of having no new medications, we have uh, medications in the pipeline, all of them designed thanks to NIH funded basic research, translational research and clinical research. So we have opportunities to discover new molecular mechanisms underlying autoimmune thyroid disease. I won't go into uh, uh, too many details, I don't have time, but I do think that we have to address the genetics of autoimmune thyroid disease, the epigenetics, their interaction, the viral uh, triggering of autoimmune thyroid disease and the role of interferon alpha, which is key in autoimmune thyroid disease. We have opportunities to translate these mechanisms into novel therapies and to translate it into novel therapies that will benefit other autoimmune diseases. Iskalimab will probably uh, may, may be beneficial for other autoimmune diseases such as RA, 
that are affected by CD40 and sephirantin may be effective in other autoimmune diseases that are influenced by DR3, such as type one diabetes. And at the end of the day, we have great opportunities to alleviate the suffering of our autoimmune thyroid disease patients. With regarding to funding of autoimmune thyroid disease research, I want uh, to bring to your attention that autoimmune thyroid disease research is completely, completely dependent on NIH funding. We have no foundations and no other source of support except small pilot grants that are given by the American Thyroid Association. Currently, the autoimmune thyroid disease grants are reviewed by endocrine study section, CSME and ICER. And the reason is that they require expertise in endocrinology and thyroidology. And my uh, most important recommendation for the committee is that I highly recommend that uh, autoimmune thyroid disease grants will continue to be reviewed by endocrine study sections. First, because the endocrine community appreciates uh, the public health impact uh, of autoimmune thyroid disease and unmet need that is not always as much appreciated uh, by other specialties. Uh, there are many thyroid specific factors. I didn't have time to talk about the role of iodine in triggering autoimmune thyroid disease and selenium in triggering autoimmune, selenium deficiency in triggering autoimmune thyroid disease. So there are many uh, thyroid specific factors. Also in uh, our mechanistic studies have clearly shown that thyroid is the key to its own demise. It's the conductor of the orchestra of immune cells that are coming to destroy it or stimulate it with PSH receptor antibodies. There's also a lot of overlap in thyroiditis between non-autoimmune and autoimmune, not just clinically, but also mechanistically. For example, two new forms of thyroiditis, immune checkpoint inhibitors thyroiditis, which appears in about 20% of patients that get immune checkpoint inhibitors, and COVID-induced thyroiditis. Both of them have an autoimmune uh, uh, component and a, a non-autoimmune component. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap in thyroiditis between the immune and the non-autoimmune. So in my opinion, expertise is required in molecular thyroidology and endocrinology when reviewing proposals in autoimmune thyroid diseases. And finally, I want to show a photo of my lab group. These are the happy days before Corona. You see us all smiling and here is now. We're still smiling, but it's just hidden behind our masks. Uh, we're <laughs> always happy. So thank you so much again for inviting me and uh, to present to you my perspective on autoimmune thyroid disease advances and opportunities. Thank you so much, Dr. Toma. We wish we could have given you five hours. Uh, with that last slide, uh, let me ask you, how do you bring in young investigators into autoimmune thyroid disease? I mean, that really is the future. How, how do you foresee bringing young investigators into the field? Um, so that's an excellent question. What is clear is all the young investigators, whether they're PhDs uh, uh, doing basic research or MDs, uh, come mostly from the endocrine uh, uh, community. Um, we need a lot of, um, there are several activities that the American Thyroid Association is doing um, to improve uh, uh, participation in meetings to uh, give grants. The grants that I mentioned that the ATA is giving is all for junior investigators. It's not for senior investigators. Um, and we're trying to increase the participation of fellows in our societies because that's where I got actually first enchanted by the thyroid field, going to a thyroid meeting uh, with my, my own uh, mentor. Um, so uh, apart from, uh, there is a whole meeting just for fellows the day before the American Thyroid Association meeting, which everything is paid for them, even the hotel. Um, I, as a fellow, attended it too, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, we need, I think, um, a lot of um, work on the part of the mentors and the societies um, to help um, young investigators, especially at the fellows uh, level and postdoc um, to, um, to go into the field. Um, in the last photo that I showed of my lab, there are three people, uh, actually four people, they're all at different stages of funding um, that, that I mentored. One has a K award, one has an AT award, another one has um, another foundation award. And um, obviously, my role, my most important role is not just to discover the mechanisms, but to actually help them uh, get and become independent and, uh, and proceed in, um, in their career. So I think most of it is in every field, it's on the mentors, but societies can play uh, a big role. 
And of course, in terms of the NIH, um, T32s uh, are almost never in thyroid. They're usually in diabetes and some are in endocrinology and that's a big uh, problem. When I was at Sinai, we had a T32 for, uh, for endocrinology, which uh, started many people's careers in thyroid, but uh, actually it was uh, not renewed. They were not able to um, renew it. I'm not at Sinai anymore, but it was not uh, renewed. But even the renewal went in as a diabetes graph. So I think there is a need for general endocrine, molecular endocrinology, translational endocrinology, clinical endocrinology, T32s, because that's the only way that you can get um, young investigators. Uh, it's one of the best mechanisms. This and the K, in my opinion, are the two biggest treasures the NIH has. And, and probably the most impact of any NIH mechanism are these two mechanisms to really start, because as you said, the future is, is the next generation. Thank you. I see Emily and Glinda. So Emily. Hi, Emily Summers, University of Michigan. Another fabulous talk, thank you. You made the, the point that there's a very high prevalence of the thyroid autoimmune diseases, especially relative to other autoimmune diseases, as well as the impact of the fact that they occur during the reproductive years and what the ramifications are for offspring. So I guess my question relates to where you, what your thoughts are about screening pregnant women or uh, women of reproductive age for perhaps unrecognized thyroid diseases. And even more broadly, if you think there might be um, more of a screening uh, mechanism for other autoantibodies that might put somebody at risk of some of the more rare uh, outcomes like neonatal lupus. So I wish I had another hour, but this is a terrific question. So let me first, uh, just one important point, even a woman that has only thyroid antibodies and completely normal thyroid functions, it has a significantly increased uh, risk uh, for uh, pregnancy loss. Um, there is not much we can do about it. Some people try to give thyroid hormones and it's very controversial. Um, and um, so, so, so it's not just having uh, abnormal thyroid. Now, the American Thyroid Association position has been strongly, and they've been advocating for universal screening of thyroid functions in all women. It's a no brainer. I mean, you know that if the thyroid functions are abnormal, um, there would be problems. Uh, but actually the obstetrics organizations have uh, objected to it, I guess, because the list of uh, mandatory screening uh, keeps on growing on them. And so this right now, I'm not personally involved in the American Thyroid Association. They have a whole task force to try and convince um, mandatory screening, but so far it's not mandated. And the same way goes, by the way, for prenatals with iodine. We all know that prenatals have to con uh, contain iodine. There is a whole advocacy group in uh, the American Thyroid Association to, to mandate that prenatals without iodine, you know, will, 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 you can't just buy them over the counter, but we still can do that. And, Iodine deficiency in pregnancy is also a huge issue. Linda? Linda, you may be on mute. Uh, no, I had to, uh, yeah. The sun's in my eyes and it's very hard for me to find the little place. But it's anyway. Good see, um, it's good to I'm see the sun. Thank you again for um, uh, a, a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to bring up the issue of, um, the chemicals that are widely used, you know, uh, environmental chemicals, um, thinking of the flame retardants, um, perchlor perchlorate, um, the phthalates that are known to be thyroid uh, toxicants. And if this is an area of research that the autoimmune thyroid community is interested in pursuing or, um, you know, what's your take on, on that? So um, the, the short answer is yes. I actually have um, a different project in type one diabetes and connection with chemical exposure. That's something that's very, not very much studies because the dogma is that type one is triggered by a viral infection. And there is even now uh, vaccines to echoviruses that are in clinical trials. Um, but, but we have a study on type one, but obviously I became much more involved in the chemicals and you're hundred percent right. There's a lot of European groups that are studying the chemicals, but very little uh, in the US. And I agree with you. I think that's an area that the thyroid community will be very, very um, uh, interested in. And do you see barriers? Um, is it just lack of familiarity or uh, not being familiar with exposure measures or what, what could, 
and NIH do to uh, push interest in that area? Um, I think, I mean, one barrier is that in, in general, as I mentioned, there is, in my opinion, a misconception that thyroid diseases, autoimmune thyroid diseases are easy to treat. So um, I've had colleagues that had comments like that, you know, we have simple treatments for Graves and Hashimoto's, but it's, as you saw, not so simple. Uh, the other barrier is really awareness. Um, um, I, I became aware of the potential connection between toxic exposures and type 1 diabetes uh, simply through collaboration with a very strong uh, uh, environmental epidemiology department at Sinai when I was there um, that raised my interest in that. So you're right, there, there has to be more awareness of, of these connections and the need to uh, study them. The whole endocrine community is very focused on uh, endocrine disruptors and cancer and reproduction, which is obviously very, very, very important, but I think less focused on the autoimmune environmental uh, connection. Seeing no other hands raised, uh, thank you very, very much, Dr. Tomer. Uh, much appreciated uh, and uh, stay with us. I'm sure there'll be some further questions as the uh, following the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Mark Peterson. Uh, Dr. Peterson is Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Digestive and Liver Disease at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He specializes in liver disease and liver transplantation, and his topic is advances and opportunities in primary biliary cholangitis. Uh, yeah, so hi, my name is Mark Peterson, and it's um, really a pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak with you guys today about the state of primary biliary cholangitis. Um, so just to start off as a quick refresher on primary biliary cholangitis, what is it? So it's a rare chronic cholestatic disease characterized by the antimitochondrial antibody or AMA and a very strong 10 to 1 female preponderance. It was previously known as primary biliary cirrhosis, which is how many of you may know it. The name changed in 2015, just to reflect the fact that most patients are now diagnosed in a pre serotic stage. Um, the image that we see here is the fluorid duct lesion, which is the pathognomonic lesion of PBC, characterized by granulomatous destruction of the bile duct. So, um, you know, a quick history here on PBC. It was actually first, they think, described in a case report back in the 1850s, um, but the name PBC finally came around in 1949. It was described as cholestasis with autoantibodies in 1958, and then it would take about 40 years for us to finally develop a treatment for it. Um, that treatment was ursodeoxycholic acid, which was approved in 1997. Um, it would take another 20 years after that for us to finally develop a second treatment, which was obetacolic acid. Now, just a little bit of information and thoughts on the pathophysiology of PVC. Um, one of the things I wanna highlight is that there's really many different hypotheses here. So there are associations with certain HLA types, including HLA-DQ1, as well as with IL-12, IL-12 receptor, and STAT4. Um, we think that there's a role for autoantibodies. So the AMA is present in up to 95% of these patients. It recognizes the E2 subunit of two oxoacid dehydrogenase complexes. In humans, this is pyruvate dehydrogenase. We know that early in the disease, there are antigens that really closely resemble the E2 subunit of pyruvate hydrogenase that actually exist on the surface of biliary epithelial cells. Um, there may be a role for molecular mimicry. So as it turns out, you know, pyruvate dehydrogenase is highly preserved among species. So exposure to foreign mitochondrial antigens in the setting of infection may trigger an autoimmune response. Um, there is a role for xenobiotics and environmental exposures. So it's been observed that there is an increased prevalence of PBC in survivors of the Nagasaki atomic bomb and patients who have lived near Superfund sites in New York. And finally, there's the bicarbonate umbrella hypothesis. So it's been observed that polymorphisms of the bicarbonate anti-exchange protein 2, or AE2, are associated with PVC. AE2 secretes bicarbonate into the bile duct, which protects the bile duct from damage from bile acids. 
Inadequate translocation of bicarbonate into the bile duct can lead to increased exposure of cholangiocytes to these toxic bile acids and potentially inflammation. Um, while we commonly think of PBC as a disease of the liver, there are many systemic symptoms and complications associated with PBC. Um, and to be honest, we don't really know the exact reason for any of these actually. Um, fatigue, for example, can be seen in 60 to 80% of patients. What's interesting about fatigue is that it can start early in disease and persist beyond transplant. Um, pruritus or itchiness can be seen in 22 to 66% of patients. It interferes with sleep in about three quarters of these patients and rated as severe in about one quarter. Um, osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease is seen in nine to 93% of patients. There's a lot of variability there just based on the def differing definitions of osteoporosis from study to study. But when we define osteoporosis by a DEXA with a Z-score less than negative 2.5, it's seen in about one third of patients. Finally, elevated, um, elevated lipids are seen in nearly all patients as the disease progresses. Um, but the clinical implication of this hyperlipidemia is not also known. Turning to the epidemiology of the disease, we know that the global prevalence of PBC is rising. It's estimated that the incidence of PBC ranges from 0.3 to 5.8 per 100,000 persons, with a reported point prevalence ranging from 1.9 to 33.8 per 100,000. Turning specifically to the United States, um, the FOLD Consortium um, or Fibrotic Liver Disease Consortium reported a 12-year prevalence of 29.3 per 100,000 persons, um, which varies by the patient demographic. So you can see the 29.3. Um, it's more common in women and especially women who are middle-aged and older. This prevalence translates into about 100,000 people in the United States with PBC. Their study also found an increase in the prevalence of disease by 72% among women and 114% among men during a 12 year period. Now I will point out that, you know, potentially part of this increased prevalence is related to earlier diagnosis. So the proportion of patients uh, presenting with mild biochemical or histological disease um, increased from 41.3% in the 1970s to 72.2% in the 1990s, and it has remained stable thereafter. Uh, for clinicians, this means that we have a long follow-up of patients with these systemic symptoms that we cannot explain why these patients have. Um, I'll also point out that earlier presentation is not the rule for all patients. So non-Caucasians tend to point or tend to present with more severe disease and more severe pruritus. Um, unfortunately, because of these reasons, they're also more likely to be ineligible for participation in clinical trials. Um, in one study of this, 46.5% of non-Caucasian patients versus 25% of Caucasian patients um, were found to be eligible. So how do these patients actually do long-term, and especially if we can get them on treatment with ursodiol? So we knew that ursodiol was gonna slow things down, but it wasn't gonna cure the disease. Response to ursodiol at one year gives us a sense of how these patients do. Um, so on the left, um, we can see that patients who respond well to ursodiol can live for many years or even decades. It's not different than the standardized population. However, without response, the median survival at 10 years ranges from 50 to 70% for asymptomatic patients it's even higher for patients who are symptomatic. And we know that up to 40% of patients may not respond or will respond inadequately uh, to ursodiol. So a lot of patients are following into this latter category with a relatively poor prognosis. So some of the advances and needs for primary biliary cholangitis. Um, one of the first needs was honestly just a surrogate endpoint for this population. So it can be difficult to run a drug study for the 10 to 20 years that are needed to see the clinical endpoints in this population. Surrogate endpoints um, such as alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin as seen here in this graph, yeah. allow us to make predictions about how patients are going to do after being on a medication for only a few months to a year or two, and has helped to overcome some regulatory barriers. 
However, longer follow-up is still needed to honestly, to actually see these clinical endpoints. The surrogate endpoint did help us to get obetacolic acid um, acel accelerated approval by the FDA in 2016. So this is an FXR agonist. So what you can see here in the graph is an improvement in alkaline phosphatase for patients on obetacolic acid, see the orange and, and blue lines here. Um, however, I'll point out that less than half of patients actually met the primary endpoint, which was an alkaline phosphatase, less than 1.67 times the upper limit of normal, and a bilirubin less than the upper limit of normal. Two other things here. So many patients cannot tolerate this treatment due to side effects such as itching, which can be seen in up to 72% of patients on this medication. And again, this is based on and approved based on surrogate endpoints. So we have yet to see the actual effect on clinical endpoints. Another important development here was the what I'm gonna call the nuclear hormone revolution. So there are several new mechanisms of action being investigated for PBC based on nuclear hormone pathways. Just to orient you to this slide, I'll point out up at the very top, we have the ileal enterocyte. Um, and down toward the bottom, we have the biliary epithelial cell in green and the hepatocyte surrounding it in beige. Um, None of these mechanisms of actions, of course, are really immunosuppression, as we would call them, or acting on the immune system. These are all really regulating and modulating the synthesis and flow of bile. So one of the first mechanisms are the PPAR agonists, such as Celadelpar and the fibrates. Um, these increase expression of ABCB4, which includes MDR3. Um, this is a transporter responsible for exporting bile acids into the bile canaliculus. It also inhibits CYP7A1, which encodes cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylate, the rate limiting step in bile acid synthesis, which converts cholesterol to 7-alpha hydroxycholesterol. There are FSXR agonists, such as obeticolic acid, tropofexor, and silofexor. These inhibit CYP7A1 in hepatocytes. Um, they increase expression of FGF19 in ileal enterocytes. And they possibly increase the expression of um, ABCB4 as well. And finally, there are actually FGF19 analogs themselves, such as NGM282. Um, this acts through FGFR4 to directly inhibit uh, CYP7A1. So there are, are a number of drug trials going on for PBC right now. Um, at the very top, you can see the FXR agonist, such as abeticolic acid, which is in phase four. There's also Chopifexor and Celifexor. All of these have shown good improvement in alkaline phosphatase and GGT, although they all seem to have the same itching like obeticolic acid of itching. There is one FGF19 analog, NGM282. Preliminary results do show improvement in alkaline phosphatase, but with some GI side effects. And there are the PPAR agonists such as elafibrinor and bisafibrate, which currently appear promising. Celadelpar also appeared promising, but clinical trials for Celadelpar were halted. Um, and this was based on findings of Celadelpar in trials for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Incidentally, on liver biopsy, they found findings of interface hepatitis suggestive of autoimmune hepatitis. There are a few other mechanisms at play here with proof of, tri proof of concept trials ongoing including um, NOx1 and NOx4 inhibitors. This is really more of an antifibrotic pathway. Um, there are sphingosine one phosphate receptor agonists, um, which is modulating uh, chemotaxis of T cells across the lymphatic epithelium. And then there is a JAK1 and 2 inhibitor, atrasimod, which is underway. And finally, there's one or two trials going on about the gut microbiome. So trialing different probiotics based partly on this idea of molecular mimicry. Um, there are needs and th we have in some advances and some needs for patient reported outcomes and all of these systemic symptoms, which you have mentioned as well. Um, so what I'm just gonna point out on this slide is if you look to the right, you'll see the current treatment algorithm for cholestatic coritis and PBC. None of these medications are more than about 60% effective. And there are many patients who don't respond to any of these medications. The other thing to notice is that these treatment options include a bile acid sequestrant, cholestyramine, and uh, antibiotics for FAMPIN, an opioid receptor antagonist, um, naloxone and naltrexone, and an SSRI, um, sertraline. 
this just kind of shows how divergent the theories of the pathophysiology are here. There is actually one more mechanism of action that's being tested, and that's the ileal apical bile acid transporter lunarixabat. It's currently in the phase three trial after encouraging phase two results. Um, there's also um, diphelicephalin, a kappa opioid receptor agonist. It's currently undergoing a proof of concept trial after conditional approvement, approval by the FDA for the treatment of uremic pruritus. Um, one topic that's caught my interest is um, the hyperlipidemia in primary biliary cholangitis. Historically, LDL has been thought to be related simply to lipoprotein X, which is anti-atherosclerotic, but it's really not just lipoprotein X. So in one sample here, only half of the patients with an, um, with, had LDL that was predominantly lipoprotein X. The bottom three patients here had cholesterol ranging from 290 to 464 milligrams per deciliter, and frankly, very little LPX was found in them. On a related note, there's the cardiovascular risk. So initial studies have shown minimal cardiovascular risk, but this was also patients with very high rates of liver decompensation, 40% plus, who already had advanced liver disease and therefore very high competing causes of mortality. The implication of cardiovascular risk for patients with early disease is unknown. There is one meta-analysis that was done on this, which shows an increased risk of cardiovascular disease with a relative risk of 1.57. And the relationship of this to hyperlipidemia, again, is not known. Just two of these other systemic, um, systemic symptoms here, we have the fatigue. Again, there's been a number of things that have been tried, including modafinil, ondansetron, fluoxetine. It's also been one of the secondary endpoints in several of the drug studies. None of them have showed an effect on fatigue. Um, there's one intervention trial that's underway, which is for mindfulness. The last one is gonna be the metabolic bone disease that we see in these patients. This can progress even with repletion of vitamin D. Um, and right now the treatment algorithm is basically the same as a patient without PBC. So you replete their vitamin D if they need it, you consider bisphosphonates, which are safe in this population. And there are no ongoing trials for metabolic bone disease. Um, so kind of looking back on all these studies and trying to get a sense of what's gonna happen in the future. So, you know, these are the current studies for PBC. The majority of them um, from clinicaltrials.gov. The majority of these are intervention drug studies. There are a few database repositories that are ongoing. Um, you know, so we're really kind of banking on this nuclear hormone receptor pathway to sort of solve this disease for us. And as far as um, funding for these clinical trials, I will just point out that none of these are funded by the N NIH. All of them are funded either by industry or by other foundations or university. Um, this is in contrast to some of the other um, autoimmune diseases that are out there like lupus and scleroderma. Um, even as far as basic science research, um, the NIH through the NIDDK is only funding two basic research studies that are directly stated as applicable to PBC. There are a handful, about 22 of NIH funded labs that are studying the molecular mechanisms of cholestasis, fibrogenesis and cholangiocyte regeneration, which may ultimately be applicable to PBC as well as other liver diseases. One other thing I'll just point out here is that there are two pediatric cholestatic liver disease consortiums um, at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and Pittsburgh um, that are funded by the NIH for clinical and translational disease, again, in pediatrics. There is nothing analogous for adults and this is going to be, you know, particularly important as we try to develop new therapies and as we try to track this real world clinical outcomes and secondary systemic symptoms, you know, over the next several decades for any new therapy that comes about. Um, so there's really a lot, I think, that needs to be done for this disease. We have a couple of theories on the pathogenesis, but there's a lot of questions that are still here. Um, there's a lot to be determined as far as the pathogenesis of systemic manifestations, um, and even still finding some new therapies and following up any new approved medications and what their clinical endpoints are and how they affect them. Um, looking to the future, 
you know, I think we still have some work to do to look beyond the next 10 years and to see what's coming next. I don't think anything that's coming down the pipeway as far as the nuclear hormone receptor pathway is gonna really cure this disease. Um, but I do think that the next decade is gonna be very promising as far as some of these new drug trials. And I think we're at least gonna be able to improve the care and slow the progression of PVC. Um, so that's, those are kind of my thoughts here. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Peterson. It's been a, a, a nice trajectory and journey that you've described for, uh, for this disease. We much appreciate it. Any questions from the um, committee specifically uh, to Dr. Peterson? Delisa? Yes, um, thank you for your presentation. I guess mine is kind of a basic research question and I uh, saw that you described sex differences, but I don't think I heard what the ratio was. And from kind of a, a mechanistic standpoint, I'm intrigued by the molecular mimicry idea of foreign uh, mitochondrial antigens. But I am wondering uh, if there's a hypothesis for how uh, that could contribute to sex differences, since that should really occur regardless, I would think, of sex. Uh, any comments related to the sex differences and and theories about that? So um, the, I can tell you the ratio is currently thought to be about 10 to one as far as female to male, um, sorry, as far as female to male. Um, and as far as the reasons for the sex difference, I don't think that we actually know the reason for the sex difference. Um, and I think, um, Dr. Mayo, if you're on the line, if you know more about the sex difference here, um, I'd be curious to hear that too. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. We, we don't know the cause. Um, genetic uh, changes, um, hormonally related changes. Um, and so far, none of them have, have panned out. <laughs> Um, so we don't know, and there haven't been any ongoing studies about that for, I don't think at least five to 10 years. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, an important gap for this and for other autoimmune diseases. Thank you. Yeah, I will just add one more comment since you brought up the sex difference, and that is I, I think there's a nice opportunity for collaboration here between different divisions of NIH. So traditionally, PBC falls to NIDDK, which I think is, is appropriate. Um, and, and, and similar to what some, on one of the other speakers said, I can't remember, I think it was the endocrinologist said that, that he felt their studies should be reviewed by, by endocrinologists. Um, I would second that and say that PBC studies should generally need to be reviewed by gastrologists or liver specialists. However, um, you know, being a very female disease, there's an opportunity for collaboration between the, the office of, of, is it women's health or women's, yeah, office of women's health, I think, that, that funds separately related, um, female related diseases. Um, and some projects would apply to both institutes, I think. I have a question about, um, um, you brought up about <clears throat> the significant um, um, racial ethnic dis differences in uh, severity at presentation and um, uh, that that also had implications for access to trials, which of course might drive more disparities uh, down the line. Is there a body of research um, already ongoing or is that potentially a need to look at things like social determinants or allostatic load, and other factors that could be driving the, um, the reasons for adva more advanced disease at the time of presentation by race? No, I think, I think that is an opportunity for research here to determine why people are presenting um, later. And there's nothing ongoing as far as research into these into, into that. I think a lot of it, or at least part of it, is certainly the social determinants of health, access to healthcare, 
who's getting their liver function test checked regularly so that we can catch alkaline phosphatase elevations early before people develop systemic disease and symptomatic disease. Um, but I, that may really just be one element of it here. Um, but certainly trying to find these patients earlier so that they do qualify for clinical trials, I think is also really important to make sure that you know, any trial that happens is really equitable across the population. Michael? Yes, can you hear me? Am I? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, uh, I'd ask you, uh, I'd like to ask all of the speakers, uh, you look at something like PBC and I, it's what I regard as a uh, fairly narrow description of an autoimmune disease. And then you listen to some of the other things like uh, Julie James's statement of lupus being this entire spectrum from uh, antibody development to uh, evolution to all sorts of things. NIH uh, has been asked to talk about how it handles uh, or we have been asked to advise NIH, how do we handle autoimmune disease? Is the best way to focus on that with disease specificity or mechanism specificity? Or if, if do you have any ideas of how best NIH could handle the general concept of autoimmune and autoimmune diseases? I'm, I'm happy to answer if it was for all participants. I, I still think, I, I know that there is a, a, you know, a lot of commonality in autoimmunity in the genetics and in other mechanisms, but um, I do think that um, especially the organ specific diseases uh, should be, uh, their home should be in, in the same institute and study section that deals with that uh, specific uh, disease like PBC. Um, um, grants reviewing by gastroenterologists as was, was mentioned before. Um, and again, my own point of view, MS in neurology and so forth, because um, we are learning more and more that the target organ is a key participant. Uh, I, we didn't talk about type one diabetes, but it is uh, clear that the beta cell is the key to its own demise. Of course, there is immune ab abnormalities and the final common pathway is immune destruction, but all the recent research uh, focuses on how beta cell dysregulation uh, causes uh, an autoimmune attack on the beta cells. And the same goes for thyroid. And also, since we are now in a translational times where many, many uh, proposals are not just at the basic, basic level, but usually involve uh, patients and translation, and the clinical appreciation of those diseases and the clinical care is at the specialty. So um, a thyroidologist will see 80% of their patients will be autoimmune thyroid disease and the other 20% will be thyroid cancer and other thyroid uh, abnormalities. Um, so I think that uh, I would advocate for um, not putting all the autoimmune diseases in, in one group together as autoimmune uh, because there's so many differences in, including in many other aspects. Um, so that's my opinion. So I agree in part with what Dr. Tomar said, but I have to say that I have a little bit of a different perspective. And so in that we have multiple autoimmune, autoimmune diseases that can actually co-localize in the same person, right? And so I, I agree with study section and that piece, but I think that autoimmune thyroid disease in um, in patients who that's their only autoimmune condition is interesting, but I also think about autoimmune thyroid disease in Sjogren's syndrome and in lupus patients and in these patients who have multiple different autoimmune diseases and what can we learn about them. I think also, as you pointed out, that we have these common targets that may work across multiple autoimmune diseases, especially if we can find the right subset of those patients that can share that target. And so I think that that there are things that we need to do alone, but there are many things that we also need to think about doing across different autoimmune diseases. Deidre? Um, thank you. Thank you for the, all of you for the wonderful presentations. I'm Deidre Cruz from, from Johns Hopkins. Um, had a, one specific question for Dr. Peterson and then a, a broader one for the, for the uh, rest of the group. I'm not sure, Dr. Peterson, if you, if you mentioned this, but given um, the, 
disparities that it sounds like are, are present in terms of presentation. I was wondering if there is work ongoing around screening um, for PBC. So thinking about alkaline phosphatase and you know, the fact that for, for people who do get at least a comprehensive metabolic panel, that could be an early indication that this may be someone warranting further screening. Is that something that's being researched, um, kind of the utility of screening like that? No, I mean, and in fact, there's really not that much in the way of screening guidelines in general for liver disease. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is now a screening guideline to check patients for hepatitis C, um, and we do that with a hepatitis C antibody. Um, but unless you are regularly going to a physician and they just happen to be checking your LFTs as part of, you know, just a general wellness exam, um, you know, that's, that's really the only encounter that people are going to have. Um, you know, people have looked at checking for the antimitochondrial antibody and using that as a screening tool as well. Um, but that's not necessarily specific for disease. So not everybody that has the AMA kind of like, will, so not everybody that has the AMA will go on to have PPC. Mm -hmm. Some of them do, but not all. Okay. Scott? Thank you. Oh, wait, oh I'm sorry, can I ask my second part? <laughs> oh, yeah, go right ahead. David. Sorry. Thanks. So my question was for the, really for everyone. Um, um, I heard a lot of discussion about pharmacologic therapies for your, um, uh, the, 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 the sort of specific autoimmune diseases that, that you are working in. Wondering if you could comment on any non-pharmacologic um, therapies on the horizon, um, particularly in thinking about those that might um, mitigate symptoms that, that um, people living with these conditions may, may have. So I think um, I mean I'm having a comment from a skin perspective. I think um, non-pharmacologic uh, agents are very interesting if, as long as they're studied. I will say that we have some major concerns with some of the immunostimulatory herbs, which we think are causing some issues, and that that needs a, that's an area we talk about environment, but that's one in particular that I would accentuate as needing a lot of work. And it's going to end up being not the same for all autoimmune diseases. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think looking at other approaches is really important, but also recognizing that there are harms that may be causing some of the increase that we're seeing. Scott, let me just say, let me open this up to all participants, uh, non-committee members through the Q&A box so we can get some questions in, uh, in addition to the committee. Scott? Sure, so I don't know. It looked like Dr. James maybe was gonna respond to that last question. I didn't wanna cut her off. Oh, I was just gonna, I didn't have any magical answers, right? I think we don't have a lot. Uh, if anybody else does, that would be great. Um, but there has been some talk about nutrition and about microbiome and um, thinking about those aspects of nutrition, especially as well as exercise, of course. And so I think that we need more comprehensive thought about the wellness of our patients with autoimmune disease, um, not only for their autoimmune condition, but for their comorbidities. So excellent point. So my question is a little bit different, but I have a question for Dr. Zwerth and, and Dr. James. Um, so in thinking about the disease heterogeneity, but also these common pathways, um, and you both presented some really fascinating studies on like personalized treatments. I am curious if your worlds have overlapped and are there studies looking at, you know, the cutaneous lupus and the systemic lupus to see if, um, you know, we can learn more about both the systemic and cutaneous features. And if, and if there are studies using all these fancy technologies in those ways, um, how, how would you say that they are successful and how can we have more of those? And if you haven't done this, I'm curious what the barriers are to, to kind of doing these types of studies. Well, I'll also start out by saying that I think there's a lot of synergy between dermatology and rheumatology, and um, our communities are very close together and collaborate. Um, and so I do think, though, that, uh, that one of the problems you run into is that um, there are patients who have skin-predominant disease, and I would say that that population really is left out of the equation very often, whether it be drug development or whatever, and especially with the FDA. You can have an approval for SLE with the same skin manifestations you see in skin, and you can't use it for the skin patient. So I think you know we, we need to work together, but we also need to define the patients that are being left out. Okay. 
And so Scott, I would, um, we actually just published a paper with Ben Chong from UT Southwestern, which looked at cutaneous lupus versus systemic lupus um, and found some similar, a lot of similarities actually, and some, some unique aspects. So I think from the basic science discovery science piece that that's starting to happen. Um, but as Vicki pointed out, this really hasn't been something that's been happening in clinical trials yet. Deirdre, you still have a question? You have, you, you have your hands raised. Nope. Okay. It was the just old one. <laughs> my old be hand. sure. Uh, Awal, anything from other participants? We have no questions in the Q&A box, but I see Sonia's hand up. Hi, Dr. Tomer. Is there any evidence that the father has any influence on, you know, the baby developing thyroid disease, like through epigenetic uh, mechanisms, you know, to sperm? Um, not that I know of, there is, uh, um, um, in type one diabetes, uh, I'm, I'm digressing, but, but it is relevant. Um, we know that, um, if the father has type one, the risk to the baby is much higher than if the mother had type one, but if the mother, um, had, uh, type one before she became pregnant, then it's the same risk. So it seems that uh, pregnancy has uh, some kind of a uh, uh, protective effect. But in uh, thyroid disease, uh, there were some studies uh, only on microchimerisms, but nothing um, um, substantial came out of it in terms of uh, um, the paternal contribution. There are some genetic susceptibility genes on the X chromosome um, that are supposed to, uh, that are proposed to contribute to the uh, uh, female predisposition. Obviously, this is not an X-linked disease, but this is just a, um, a risk factor on the X chromosome that you're more likely to get if you have two X chromosomes than one. That's how it can increase the frequency uh, in uh, women. But I don't know of any uh, male factors that are associated. Thanks. We do have a question in the Q&A box. Uh, for, this is for Dr. Peterson on PVC diagnosis. So would uh, serum bile acids and CD73 be used in diagnosis in addition to serum ALP and GGT? So there are, there's on some, that's, it's still an unmet need, I believe, to see if there's any other um, biomarkers that will lead to the diagnosis of PVC. Um, right now, the diagnosis I just kind of lost the question. Um, right now, the diagnosis is made on um, serum alkaline phosphatase level and um, the presence of an AMA and or um, consistent uh, pathology on liver disease. Um, serum bile acids can rise with many different liver diseases or any cholestatic disease. And so, you know, certainly they may go up later on. I don't know that they would be as helpful for early diagnosis of the disease um, or necessarily specific for it. Thank you. Ms. Barbara, I have another question. This is um, for Dr. Wirth. Um, you made a big point of pointing out the data about quality of life and these um, disorders with the skin, primarily skin manifestations. Uh, do you think that, uh, it sounded like there was an implication that either people shied away from going into this science to study these conditions or maybe such proposals weren't considered as significant and so weren't received as well. Do you think we're past all that now or do you think that's still an issue that may be a barrier to to research? I mean, I, I think that, that we're, we're getting better. I mean, I think that there had not been, uh, you know, I think quality of life has been very important. I think sometimes when a disease is life-threatening, it's easier to think that we have to um, put money into research. But I think I showed examples of how impactful this is. So it's also a matter of how the allocation goes and what the priorities are. And I think that 
um, you know, they go hand in hand. I think if there's interest in funding, people will go there. Um, I also think it's a rather unique uh, skill set that people have to have to bridge uh, between fields to some extent. As we pointed out, we collaborate a lot between Durham and Room, and so it's, it's having those uh, career awards that allow people to develop um, a, a rather broad skill set facilitates, and that's been hard to, to do as well. So I think there are a number of barriers, and I don't think it's completely fixed. We have a very thin workforce here. Um, Andrea? Hi, I uh, appreciate all the presentations today. I have a question for uh, Dr. Tomer. Um, just, you know, thinking about your comment during your presentation that you know, most of the funding for autoimmune thyroid disease is dependent on the NIH. And just wondering what your thoughts are, you know, in, in terms of, you know, going into the future, do you think that that is problematic? And, you know, if so, what, um, what would you like to see happen in terms of, you know, funding sources and what ideas or what has your group been thinking about? So yeah, that's an excellent question. I think that it's especially problematic at the younger stage. Many, many junior investigators start on a fund. I've seen so many people's careers, you know, take off with a foundation grant or a smaller grant that, that gave them the, the protected time to do research and then move on to an age funding. Um, so I think that um, at, at the minimum, um, if you know, there was more um, funding for T32. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, that could uh, partially, uh, um, you know, um, help for that. Obviously, we the, the, there is no currently major foundation. There's small foundations that fund thyroid cancer, uh, but not thyroid autoimmunity. Um, but I, I think that um, especially more help from the NIH to junior investigators, that's where I think foundations are uh, critical um, as opposed to established investigators that usually, um, you know, um, it's easier for them to get NIH funding than at the very beginning of your career. So I think that more funding for, for the junior um, uh, faculty, postdocs, fellows uh, to start a career in thyroid autoimmunity research will be very helpful. Andrea asked a key question for the committee. And uh, if anybody else has a response to that question, that would be helpful for us and inform us uh, as we go forward in our thinking. I actually, I do have a follow-up question, Dr. Tomer. Um, you know, the, also thinking about what you said about how, um, and Dr. Peterson as, Peterson as well, that, you know, for your subject area, it really does, in terms of reviewing grants, um, require some content expertise from, in your case, the endocrinologist, in Dr. Peterson's case, um, gastroenterologist. Like, what do you think about, you know, the possibilities of if within NIH, let's say, grants were reviewed outside of the endocrine section, and then there was, you know, an endocrinologist brought into that section, in your case, Dr. Tomo, do you think that that would be feasible um, for, you know, sort of broadening the funding opportunity across NIH, but still having content expertise? You know, I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's a big question. If you have a, let's say, a panel of autoimmunologists and an endocrinologist comes in, first of all, um, because there might not be so many grants from endocrine that maybe one person covering type one diabetes and autoimmune thyroiditis and autoimmune ophritis that cause premature menopause. So um, I, I'm, I'm a little um, uh, concerned that, you know, that one person will need to bring their expertise to cover all endocrine knowing, you know, that, that, that uh, bringing all the expertise necessary in study sections is, is difficult and challenging to begin with. Um, so I believe that the reverse would work uh, better. And that's usually what's happening now. So usually somebody with expertise in autoimmunity or basic immunology or, or translational immunology joins the study sections and comments on several grants more than thyroid that, that have to do with autoimmunity. So my personal opinion is that I still think that the, the current uh, situation where it sits in the 
uh, disease specific specialties is the best, um, especially with young investigators that will all practically all in the thyroid autoimmunity field will come from the endocrine field. Um, so I think that they'll feel that that's, that's their home, the, the NIDDK and, and the endocrine home. That's, that's my feeling. Um, you know, I, I guess I would, I would kind of agree with that, that I think that the home of PBC is still largely with NIDDK. I think that's where you're going to find the people who, you know, really specialize in this disease and see these patients or do research on these patients on a regular basis. Um, but certainly there's opportunities for, for some crosstalk or bringing in other experts, especially with some of these systemic manifestations, people to opine on cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, um, metabolic bone disease could certainly come from cardiology or endocrinology. Um, so, you know, I think being open to collaboration or bringing someone in is good. I think that it's probably going to remain something that's um, more closely tied to digestive diseases, though. Judith, did you have a, uh, an answer? So can I go back to your first question, Andrea, because I actually thought that was a really good question about getting junior people into the field and then, you know, what, where do we need to have um, the kind of support? And so the NIH has actually done a number of different things to try and make it easier for junior investigators um, between the K awards, the early stage investigator awards, the differing pay line for uh, first time for early stage investigators, the new CATS award that doesn't require preliminary data. I think that there's many of those things once you kind of get to that point. In some ways, Dr. Tomar, I think it's trying to get people from the fellowship point to see this as a career or even at the late residency point. And that's kind of where you think about T32s, but T32s are getting fewer and fewer slots. And so if there were some way to kind of help that pipeline at the beginning. And then I think that the other place, and maybe this is because I've been a department chair for so long now, is that it's the people who've had an R01, um, but are having a hard time getting to that R01 renewed or to, you know, it's kind of that we've already put a lot of investment into these people. They're starting to take off in the field, but they, you know, put it in twice and they don't have as much institutional support as they used to. So I think in the NIH has things like the R56 and some other things, uh, but I think we don't wanna make a whole lot of new programs for additional early stage investigators if there's no pipeline to move them forward. I have a comment, actually, there's something very simple that at least NIDDK can do that will help uh, a lot of uh, investigators applying for K. I don't know if you're familiar, but NIDDK limits the application for uh, K01 to seven years from getting your PhD. I'm not sure what is the reason. It's unique for NIDDK, it's not other institutes, but I've seen it preventing several people from getting their grant because of missing this seven year mark by a few months. I mean, passing it being more than seven years. And in today's world, it's not so easy to be five years postdoc and then within uh, in, right. ending your postdoc ship and submitting a K. And to me, I wouldn't put any deadline, but at least extending it to 10 years. I, I've seen two people in my department that, that uh, one was administratively re actually returned. Uh, the other one I was told not to apply. And to go straight to an R from a postdoc, that's very, very hard. So I think that I'm not sure what is the rationale for that. I know that people want people to get starting on their career as early as possible, but sometimes you need time to get data and to be ready to submit your grant. Thanks for that point. I see no other hands raised. Any other questions Owl, that you have that I'm missing? We have no questions in the Q&A box. Well, let me thank everybody for what has been a very informative uh, afternoon and uh, quite a lot of material for us to digest. Again, I wish we had five hours more each. That would have been very informative for all of us, but not practical at the moment. Um, so uh, we'll end our open session in a few moments. If there are any other comments or questions you can send those to uh, Henrietta Awo also Anto, who was our project study director and who's been participating in our Q&A here. And she can be re uh, re reached at autoimmunestudy at nas.edu. That's autoimmunestudy at nas.edu. Uh, please keep in mind that any material you wish to share with the committee 
uh, will be made public through the project public access file. That's because the National Academies complies with section 15 of the Federal Advisory Committee Act rules. Once again, we're very thankful. We may have some additional questions to some of the guest speakers today. Uh, if so, we will communicate with you directly. And if you don't mind, uh, perhaps uh, uh, provide us some materials related to what we could use to inform us for our statement of task and writings. Thank you once again. Enjoy the weekend. The committee will reconvene in closed section at about uh, 3.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.